Good evening and a warm welcome to the book launch of Sayyid Haider Raza, The Journey of an Iconic Artist, authored by eminent scholar, art historian and curator Rishodra Dalmia. The Kiran Nada Museum of Art KDMA is a pioneering private museum focused on exhibiting, collecting and documenting modern and contemporary art from India and the subcontinent. The first post-colonial generation of artists and their modernist assertions, the formations of artist-initiated groups were inspirational in shaping and building upon the core collection of KNMA. The short-lived but legendary progressive artist group in Bombay, founded in the same year that India became independent, was known for its free-spiritedness and rebellious nature. Raza was one among the young struggling artists along with F.M. Souza, M.F. Hussain, K.H. Ara, S. Bakre, and H.A. Gade. Their aspirations aimed at putting India on the international art map. The collection in KNMA on the moderns was subsequently expanded and substantially enriched by works of Hussain, Raza, and Souza, representing the breadth of their practice. Raza's practice, quite distinct from his friends and fellow travelers, marked an interesting journey from his early cityscapes and landscapes captured instinctively by the fury of his brush and thick impasto, and the subsequent shifts he made to arrive at a symbolic vocabulary and a distilled form in geometric abstraction unfolded an extraordinary oeuvre through his long years spent before the canvas. Raz always expressed that he was not an abstract painter. His art embraced the cosmos, the elements and energies of the cosmos, the passage between form and formlessness through reverberations, incantations, and formal rhythms in his painting. For instance, in the painting Bhumi, one witnesses his subtle and sophisticated language of abstraction, the earth Bhumi changing colors through seasonal cycles. Several other works in KNMA collections, such as Savrashtra, Germination, Bindu, highlight Raza's interest in the metaphysical and spiritual dimensions of color and radiating through his pulsating forms. KNMA is delighted to partner with HarperCollins on the celebratory occasion that marks the onset of Raza's centenary year. Raza was born on 22nd February, 1922. I would now like to hand over the proceedings of this evening to Yashodra Dalmia, the author of the book that's, that reads like the most nuanced and comprehensive biography of the artist. And she's in conversation with Ashok Vajpayee, eminent poet, critic, managing and life trustee of the Raza Foundation, and one who knew Raza for the longest time. The first definitive biography, Sayyid Haider Raza. It has been widely hailed uh, by the art circles, by many people who have had the chance to read it or leaf through it. And among them is the senior most friend and contemporary of Raza Sahab, Krishan Khanna, and many others. So it's a remarkable biography, and this is the first ever of Raza, covering a period of, well, 95 years, almost. So Yashodara Ji, tell us, how, how did you feel writing the biography? You have written a biography of Amritar Shergil earlier, but this one, after so many years, how did it feel like and what kind of anxieties and difficulties you faced? Thank you, Ashokji. Um, first of all, I must say I was amazed by the life of the artist. Uh, the fact that Raza was born in a small village in central India and uh, had uh, come from very humble origin and his estimation to uh, uh, an artist of great fame, uh, it was fascinating to watch 
his uh, right to say uh, by sheer skill and uh, perseverance and his great humility. Uh, you know, his humility and grace is uh, what one felt uh, so uh, uh, attractive to. Uh, but Ashokji, you yourself have known him for uh, more than half his lifetime. What do you think contributed to this? Well, you know, Radha used to mention his early life and the, both the beauty of nature and the fear of nature, because nature will also turn virulent, the river would be in a spade, the Narmada would surround and you know, drown everything around. So he was, in a manner of speaking, caught between beauty of nature and fear of nature. I think one of his life is struggle, in a manner of speaking, would be to see that how he got over the fear and celebrated and rejoiced and allowed himself and his palate to, 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 to paint nature. And I think this is an important element that, that, of course, as you mentioned, he was a very a man of great humility. Uh, uh, he used to say, all my art is by way of gratitude to the world. He loved the world. I mean, you know, he was a lover of, uh, he was a man of great taste and he loved good things of life. And yet uh, he created an art, which I, I think, and as you have, of course, explored it much more deeply than I would, um, uh, his art became almost synonymous with his living. Uh, he had no other uh, objective, as it were, no other aim in life. He was not trying to reach anywhere except to his own art. So that, I think, uh, uh, creates a very interesting, and there are many episodes that you have cited in this. Uh, um, incidentally, I may tell you that the book is already being translated into Hindi and it would be published next month, hopefully. And already translations in Bengali, Marathi, Malayalam, and hopefully Urdu would be taking place. And we are aiming that they are all done and published through the 100th year of Raza, which would start on the 22nd. Um, any difficulties that you faced in writing the book? I mean, uh, you know, uh, knots that you had to uh, undo and, and tell us about that. Because it's a narrative, but also an art critical uh, analysis goes by. So, you know, you, know, you are, you are uh, in a manner of speaking, narrating a life, but you're also analyzing the art that is being produced by that life, in, in a sense, yeah. I think the main difficulty, Ashoki, uh, was that um, the artist himself, uh, of course, uh, was no longer there. And many of his colleagues also uh, were not there anymore. So uh, to get, uh, you know, uh, first-hand reminiscences and uh, accounts. And then, uh, of course, uh, most of all, his wife was no longer there. So that presented a problem. And uh, in addition, uh, all his family left for Karachi and the hall at the time of partition. And uh, so there was, uh, as such, no near family member uh, left in India. Although he carried on a very uh, vibrant uh, correspondence with his uh, brothers. And uh, in, in that also, he revealed uh, when they asked him that you are the only one left here, why don't you join us? 
he said, I, I cannot leave the land of Gandhi. And, uh, you know, it was um, his belief in Gandhi, actually, which uh, made him do a wonderful piece of painting in uh, 2013, uh, which is, you know, which brings out uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, you know, faith in non-violence, faith in men, and uh, the pain of others. He, he was essentially uh, a very, uh, he believed in uh, people, he was a humanist, and he allied very much with Gandhi. So, uh, you know, uh, coming back to the difficulties of writing this book, I would say the only thing was that uh, many of his colleagues were no longer there, but uh, and his family members. But uh, what Raza did do was that he kept uh, the minutest record of his life. Uh, you know, he preserved things. He kept his letters. He kept his, uh, you know, even his bills, his smallest. So, yes, we, we, <laughs> we have in our archives about 40,000 <laughs> letters, uh, 20,000 written to him and 20,000 or more, the drafts that he created by way of reply or replies, photocopies of that. He was very meticulous in keeping all these. Yes, yes, go ahead. And you made very good use of them, I must say. Thank you, but he is uh, a biographer's dream in that sense. Yeah. So he preserved things and he kept them very carefully. And so it, it was uh, wonderful to go through them and uh, see the twists and turns of his life. Yeah. And I think one of the important uh, aspects is your exploration of his uh, relationship with his brothers and, and, and the correspondence that took place because his brother also became an important, and two of them became important figures in the world of Pakistani modern art. And therefore, there are two brothers, one staying in India, insisting on his Indian nationality. Uh, as you know, Raza never took French nationality, although he lived there for 60 years, but he retained his Indian passport and was very proud of being Indian. So here was one, Brother staying here, becoming an iconic painter. And there was the other who also played an important role in Pakistani uh, modern art. Uh, this is also a very interesting thing that has uh, come out in your book. Um, also, you have analyzed some of the uh, works that you think are important. Uh, uh, important landmarks in his journey. Would you like to talk something about them? Well, um, uh, Ashokji, the fact that uh, the Bindu itself emerged uh, in the early 80s came uh, from this deep uh, sense of being uh, rooted in India. And uh, before I go into his work, I just wanted to say that this is the other fascinating thing about Raza, that he spent over half a century in uh, France. And yet, he is, uh, you know, he's very Indian. He doesn't give up his nationality. He knows Hindi very well. Other thing, he was a trilingual person. Knew Hindi very well, spoke and wrote in Hindi, of course, French and English. And he kind of paid um, obeisance to Islam, to Hinduism and Christianity. So he was tri-religious and trilingual. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, whenever he would go, and I have watched him uh, saying something unto himself uh, in, in Paris' studio. So I once asked him, what is this mantra-like thing that you do? He said, no, that's a poem of Rilke uh, that I, uh, I recite 
before I I start my work in the studio. And the and the and the poem, I mean the lines that I, I, I remember them correctly, is something to say that uh, let me be able to listen to that silence of the inner voice or something like that. Uh, very real Kayan. Uh, the other aspect that comes out, and of course you have quoted the letters, his love letters to Janine, and they are remarkable in the sense that here is someone who has done only matriculation in India, and his studies did not go very far uh, after that. He only trained himself in art, and when he is quoting uh, Janine, uh, he is quoting Baudelaire and Paul Valéry. And, and, and what you have, I mean, the, the whole uh, uh, series of very important, uh, almost contemporary, in a sense, um, French writers. So this is also another aspect which comes out. That, uh, so, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, of course, all biographies are, in a, in a manner of speaking, destined to be inadequate to the life that they try to cover and describe. Don't you think so? Absolutely. I, I think I've, I've touched the tip of the iceberg and that uh, I still have to plumb the depth. And um, the more I do go into it, the more there is to discover and find. But... Uh, the amazing thing is Raza himself, uh, you know, he's very, uh, for example, his life could be compared to that dark uh, circle which emerged in his uh, work in the early, early 80s first. It's, you know, it's a void, but it's full of death. And uh, it's, uh, the dark circle itself emanates light and color. And uh, this is the concept which he strongly believes in. And uh, it continues to emerge in his work uh, uh, more and more uh, with the progression of time. So uh, it's fascinating to watch this, uh, the permutations and combinations of the Bindu, as he called it, and uh, see its, uh, uh, in later stages, its ascension towards uh, spirituality as well. Yeah, I mean, he, he, his, his insistence on form, he was very insistent on form, and he believed the form itself is, is a spiritual in, in, its, in its genesis, in its energy. Uh, uh, you don't have to import some spiritual ideas into it. The form itself, in a manner of speaking, is deeply rooted in the spiritual aspect of the artist. And um, so therefore he was not, uh, once in a while, of course, there will be uh, some, some, some images or signs which would, can be termed as spiritual, but otherwise, uh, his canvases are uh, do not uh, do not uh, propose, as it were, uh, some kind of a spiritual appreciation. They evoke that spirit, spirit anyway, uh, without being theatrical, without being too blunt or too direct. Don't you think so? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, they don't. They, they're not in any sense. Uh, religious, but uh, they evoke a sense of heightened grace, yes. I would say, uh, rather than spirituality, which uh, emerges more and more as the years go by. But the other thing, Shokri, is his uh, use of words in his yes. things. And uh, the most poignant and uh, wonderful words he made is a line from your poem, uh, yeah. Mother was a ring when I returned home. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a wonderful yeah. And it combines uh, 
you know, the thin, dark center with a very vibrant, flashing uh, flame, red, blue, yellow. So how did this come about? How was this uh, sentence from a poem? I think his, his, his love for Hindi poetry particularly began in the primary school where his teacher, you know, he was one man who could remember his primary school teachers and middle school and high school teachers' names, his favorite teachers, almost every day in Paris. When I used to live with him every day, we would talk at least five, ten minutes about his teachers. So, as much, so much so that I started remembering their names myself. And when, <laughs> when he would sort of uh, fumble, I would immediately suggest that the, uh, you mean Beni Prasad Sthapak or you mean uh, Gauri Shankar Lahari or whatever. You see, it, his reaction to the visual form of the words also very interesting. He used to sit down on the floor and write the whole line of a poem, which will then be transferred onto the canvas, his own handwriting. And he would do it very meticulously. You sometimes ring me up from Paris to ask me, he wants to name this painting some Hindi word or some Sanskrit word and whether it will be proper and is it this, is it that, etc. So I think his, his basic, I mean, he used to say sometimes, you should not just see my pictures, you should also listen to them. Because there is a kind of a resonance and music and there's also a kind of poetry of colors. Uh, we, we have an exhibition going on, which is being called Dance of Elements. So there is a bit of a dance. So in a manner of speaking, he, 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 he in his own way, has, has created a, a kind of an art which has uh, resonances elsewhere. Most certainly in poetry, in music, and sometimes in dance. And these all elements, in a manner of speaking, came together uh, when a, a, a great work of art was created by him. But they kept on knocking his door, as it were, uh, and if he would. You see, he is perhaps the only painter who has nearly a hundred canvases with lines of poetry taken from Vedas and Upanishads to Kabir and Ghalib and Mir and Age and Muktibodh and, and and even me, so it's a it's a long and I don't think any other painter, not only in India but elsewhere, has used so much poetry uh, on his canvases as Raza did. Well, it's a yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just I'm uh, remembering the. Uh, his work when it was displayed at the Festival of Avignon in 1995. Yes. And uh, it was this uh, superb work of his, not really. And it was on the backdrop for a Kathak dance performance and poetry recitation by you. So, in a way, his work uh, manifested what you're talking about poetry, dance, music. Yeah. I mean, that was coming together. In fact, that performance, it was not backdrop. It was not used as a backdrop. Actually, actual paintings came and went away uh, on the stage. They were brought on wheels and they were also projected on the on the screen. Uh, this, was, this, this took place in the White Chapel of the uh, Penitent, or whatever the French, I don't I, uh, They are not announced, pronounced it. Uh, and it was not, it was, uh, you know, he, he would believe that the word has its place, painting has its place. Neither the word is about the painting, nor the painting is about the word. They coexist, touch each other, as it were, gently, sometimes reaching for each other. That was the title of the performance. And he, he, he therefore allowed the word to exist in its own autonomous dignity. On the other hand, he also wanted the word to allow the painting to exist in its own autonomous uh, dignity. And, and there was a kind of a, a mutual respect that he would create, a, a, a kind of a, 
a, a quiet, a dialogue in silence rather than an obvious uh, the vocal dialogue. Yes, I think so. Well, perhaps we, we have run out of our time. We have been, <laughs> we were told to do 25 minutes or 20 minutes. Have we run out? But unless you want to say something, please go ahead. Would you like to read something? Uh, so what I would like to actually talk about is this wonderful painting, uh, Mother, what shall I have been when I return home? Because home he came to, to, at the end of his life and he generated uh, on returning a great deal of creativity and art. And so that's what he brought back with him. But uh, what, did he always yearn to come back to India? Was he? Uh, he was so and very. He, you know, he had both both these uh, emotions running parallel. One was that I have never left India. I, I am an Indian. I have an Indian passport. I live in India in my mind, in my spirit. On the other hand, when he could afford to, he started coming to India every year. And invariably accompanied by Jani. And they will both spend sometimes two to three months here. And earlier on, they used to stay in Bal Chhabra's place in Bombay. And he used to paint also here. I mean, go around in Rajasthan and Saurashtra and Madhya Pradesh, et cetera. I have gone to, you know, we, we went with Radha to locate that village, which had disappeared, you know. At Babaria, where in one of the ten hut hutments he was born, because the forest the village, forest villages are always moving. So there was thick forest where he was born. Perhaps there was no sign left. <laughs> but but there was, you know, you know, he was also very very respectful of the river Narmada. He would never mention it as Narmada. We'll say Narmada Ji, because this is how. And one of the interesting things about Narmada is, that unlike the other holy rivers, it is supposed to be Ubhay Tattatirtha. That is, it has holy places on both sides, on both sides of the river. And in a manner of speaking, this applies to Radha himself. He has India and France. Uh, tradition and modernity. You have fury, uh, passion, and tranquility and silence. You have great uh, uh, sort of uh, abundance of colors on the one hand, and you have very quiet withdrawal almost into the white and so all these contraries, as it were, were on both sides of him, both as a painter and perhaps as a human being. So I think, uh, Yashoda Ji, you have done a great job in being the Rata Foundation and among the art-loving community, are very grateful that you have uh, done uh, the first uh, really substantial biography of Raza, and uh, we look forward to its being read, admired, reviewed uh, more and more. Thank, Thank you. you, Thank you for your support.